Good morning. morning. I'm Warren Baldwin. I'll be teaching your classes this week. Thank you for being here and supporting the camp, being a part of this camp, and for allowing me to be a part of this week with you. I'm here with my wife, Cheryl, who will be here until Tuesday morning. We actually came up at the end of last week and spent a couple days because our son was speaking last week, and he is somewhere here with his wife, Megan, and their son. He was just walking down here. He may have had to go back, but Wes, Megan, and Easton are here. I'll also mention that I've got an elder and his wife was my secretary up until just a week or two ago for 12 years or so. But Keith and Linda are sitting right here. Um, if you want to raise your hand. Bruce is in the back, was one of my elders until a short time ago, and he moved to Houston and his wife, Nina, right here, who has roots, of course, in Montana. Many of you know her. There is someone else here from Houston I want to point out to you later. Audrey? Is somewhere here, right over there. So you guys may know some people in common from down there. I do want to mention one other person, um, and maybe through the course of the week, we'll, um, as I get to know more of you, that we'll have these kind of connections that mean so much, both this week and also many years from now. But as I was serving last night, somebody went through line that I said, that name is so familiar, and it should be. But Sylvia Harris is sitting right here, if you want to hold your hand up. Um, she was one of my teachers in college. I graduated, and she was my teacher before that. Was that date clear? I graduated. Is that clear enough? Okay. I think you're my teacher. I think you're my teacher in 78 or 79 at Fried Hardeman. And I don't know if I've seen her since 1980 when I graduated. So that was just pretty neat to meet on a mountain in Montana. You know, it's only in the church, I think, where that sort of, maybe not only, but it certainly is enhanced in the church that we have those kind of connections that 38 years later we encounter each other in a spiritual setting like this. Spiritual because we're here for Bible study and, and worship, but also spiritual because whenever people are gathered together in the name of Jesus, it's a special thing. But also because of just look at the surrounding, that uh, the surroundings we have, we have here. Um, I think God can be seen in the, the oceans and lakes and rivers, in the prairies of West Kansas, where I live now, in the mountains. Um, but when you have this kind of scenery around you, it's just a reminder that um, none of this is an accident, is it? Nope. We're all here by God's grand design. It's just a neat thing. And when you encounter each other 38 years later, there's a purpose in that. I was going to say before the nurse came in last night, and that's Lindsay, right? And Lindsay's here. We haven't actually met, but I was glad to see you walk in because I was thinking, okay, what class did I have with Sylvia Harris? It was first aid. <laughs> so when Richard was talking last night, we don't have a nurse. I said, well, if somebody sprains their ankle, they can come to me and I can either fix your ankle or I can yell, Sylvia, over here. And that's probably what I would do because I may have forgotten some of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for blessing us with life. Thank you for blessing us with spiritual life in your son, Jesus. And thank you for blessing us for the week at this great camp. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. For Bible classes in the morning, we'll be doing a series on leadership that will be based on a project I did several years ago. Several last it would be from Proverbs. It will not be from Proverbs, but Proverbs does inform the study. Um, I read through Proverbs to find five. Uh, there may be more, but I identified five what I thought were important truths from Proverbs about the development of the kind of character God wants for spiritual leaders, leaders in his churches, leaders in Christian families. So I've identified five, which works out very well because we'll have a class on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is off and we'll end Friday. So there's five days. And in the evenings or for worship service, such as our worship service this morning, and then worship during the evenings, we'll do uh, lessons from the parables of Jesus. So. Proverbs, parables kind of you know, meets a little bit. The lessons for the, the leadership will not necessarily be from Proverbs, I'll say again, but Proverbs does inform them. One of the first things to think about when we think about leadership has got to be community development. Community. Because if you are a leader without a community, you're really not much of a leader, are you? If you're walking down the road by yourself and somebody says, what are you? You can say, I'm a leader. And what's that going to communicate to them? You're nuts. Right? Because they look, well, where's your following? 
Well, I don't need to have a following to be a leader. Well, yeah, you really do. So when we think about leadership, one of the first things we've got to think about is community. And in order for us to be leaders, we have to have a community. And in order for there to be a community, there have to be people that are capable of leading it to help give it its shape, its structure, its destiny. So there really is a circular process here where the leaders feed the community and help it and aid it along. But at the same time, the community is producing its leaders, training and developing them so that they are fit to serve in the future. And if that process gets out of whack, there can be some serious danger. Why would I turn to Proverbs for anything about spiritual leadership in churches today? In fact, I was asked that question. Why would you look at Proverbs? Why not look at a New Testament book, since today we are obviously followers of Jesus? Why not look at James? Why not look at um, the Gospels? Why not look at the life of Jesus? Why Proverbs? The interesting thing I find about Proverbs is, and obviously I think it's a fit book because it's in the Bible, and it has been used to shape leaders in the past. When did Proverbs get written? Why was Proverbs written? When did it be, become a document of its own? We know in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 1, it says that the men of Hezekiah's court collected the Proverbs. That means there were Proverbs in existence, and they were probably just scattered and all over. Why sayings that people would come up with, like Solomon, who wrote thousands of Proverbs, we know from 1 Kings, but also um, Lemuel's mother, wrote Proverbs, right? She wrote a few that then got produced in the book of Proverbs. Agur, at the very end of Proverbs, he wrote, we know at least three people who wrote Proverbs. There could have been many more. And if you look at the time of Solomon to Hezekiah's court, that's roughly 200 years. For a 200 year period, Proverbs are being written and produced and put into circulation. And at some point, the men of Hezekiah's court were at some um, incident, some occasion, some occurrence made them think, we ought to gather these together and put them in a unified whole so people have the benefit of them. When were they put into circulation in the final form that then became a part of the Old Testament? And the truth is, we don't know. But one um, valuable speculation is, maybe during the exile, Israel had been destroyed. There was no infrastructure left. The community that produced leaders and that the leaders led was destroyed. Proverbs or Psalm 74 describes the men coming into Israel and destroying the walls, destroying the temple, taking axes to the paneling and totally destroying it. There was no more prophetic voice or priestly voice because priests were killed, prophets were killed, or they were taken into captivity, or they were exiled. What people were left in Israel had no infrastructure, no school system, no families, no prophetic or priestly role to teach them. Lamentations describes children wandering the streets with dry mouth, meaning they're thirsty, but their parents are not there to give them water or food because they're dead or they're hauled off into captivity and they're crying with no one to dry their tears. Oh, it's a horrible sight. It's a horrible picture. And it may well be that it's after that time when some of the wise men who perhaps were left in Israel or were in captivity said, what do you, what do, you do? How do you pass on the ethics and values of your community when the, all the people in charge of doing that are gone? They're not there to do it. And maybe that's when Proverbs was circulated because Proverbs doesn't have a lot of history. It doesn't have a lot of speculative teaching. Proverbs just describes things as they are or as they should be. A stitch in time saves nine. There's really no arguing with that, is there? A rolling stone gathers no moss. We have secular proverbs that when you hear them, you go, oh yeah, that's true. But the spiritual proverbs are the same way. The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish woman tears hers down. You've seen women and mothers who nurture and care and feed, not just the the physical nutrition to their family, but the emotional and spiritual as well with the teaching and the love and the hugs and, you know, the patience. But you've also seen where some parents will destroy their family with constant criticism, constant um, uh, failure to appreciate and to love and to nurture, and they destroy their own family. You don't have to have that explained to you, do you? The wise woman builds her own house, but with the the foolish woman destroys her house with her own hands. Or the man who gives, 
The gentle answer calms anger, but the man who answers with anger stirs more anger. Do you have to have that one explained? No. You see, if the man loses his cool and somebody yells at him and he yells back before you know it, they're now punching. But the one who just says, you know, let me, let me think about this and get back to you. Okay, can we talk about this more tomorrow? I've always had a hard time with that myself. But the wisdom of that statement, when you hear it, does not need to be explained. Can you see why perhaps the time that Proverbs was put into circulation was at a time when there was no one to really teach the wisdom and to teach the traditions of the heritage of Israel and a child or a teenager, a young man could read some of these statements and say, boy, you know, this, this makes sense. Maybe this is what they meant before our nation was destroyed, that, that a foolish leader is a curse to the people, but a righteous leader wins their praises. And we've had some foolish leaders, and we better do better in the future. You see, I think Proverbs is a very good book to look to for leadership. God has developed several communities that are critical and crucial to the ongoing life of, of, uh, of God's spiritual family. Okay, and the first is Israel. Um, let's actually go back before Israel, because there actually was another one, and that is the family. For the sake of time, we'll just, I'll just kind of go over a couple of these verses very quickly. But Genesis 1, 27 and 28, when God's back at creation, what does he say about the family? Let us make man in our image. And God made man and woman in his image. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. And then he told them <coughs> to replenish the earth, to populate the earth. Replenish the earth does not mean, as some have speculated, that there was already a population and they died off and now God says repopulate it. Replenish simply means populate the earth. Okay, have children, have babies, bring forth life and populate this earth. And what a shame we live in an age today where we don't believe that. So we've got people preaching that we need to start cutting back because there's, there's too many people on planet earth and we're going to destroy it. I don't know what God's plan is for planet earth. I really don't. But I do know when God says, I made a man and a woman and I blessed them to come together and have children. And now you have social scientists that say he didn't really make man or woman. We don't know what we are. Be whatever you want. And if you don't want to have kids, go get kittens. They're just as good. Well, I've had both. I've had three kids, not one grandkid. And the week before we came here, I gave away 10 kittens and I got three more to catch to give to somebody. Okay, there is a big difference between kids and kittens. And when God says, I gave you the, the spirit and the body and the will to have children, that's my plan because I want the community of the family and I will build communities and churches and nations on the backs of families. That is God's plan. And when you have social scientists today that say, ah, hogwash, we don't even know what we are. So you can be either or. You can be this or that, or you can be nothing in between, whatever you want. There's confusion there. And I think the word calls us back to this right here, the idea of community. This is not to make fun of those who, because of situations in their life, are genuinely struggling to understand their purpose, their place, and their value. Everything God gives us at creation, purpose, place, and value. Because of circumstances in some people's lives, they may question that, and they may wonder. And what I'm just saying is not to make fun of that, but to help them realize that the answer to the questions we have about why I'm here, who I am, what my identity is, is not to go with the flow of the world, which just confuses us more. But go back to the one who engineered us and produced us and can explain to us what we're here for and what our purpose is. The first family or the first community God made is the family. And would anyone here want to think about going through life without family? Even if you've had a bad family, and by that, I mean perhaps a family where you haven't been nurtured the way you, sh you would have liked to have been, and you're trying to nurture your own family now. If you hadn't had that family, guess where you would be now? I, I don't know where, just somewhere out there, wherever you are before you get here. You know, you just wouldn't be, right? You, you wouldn't be. So even a poor family that produced you is still a blessing from God because you're here. Okay, things didn't go well when you were younger, and there's a horrible struggle. I understand that. But you're alive for the struggle. And there's joy that can be found. 
community. And the first community God gave us is family, and we're all part of one in some way or another. The second community God created was Israel. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Let's go ahead and read that one. It's a very formative verse in the Bible. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Notice this, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. What God is setting forth very early in the life of community is when God blesses us, he does not bless us so that we become the final container to hold those blessings. Rather, he blesses us that we become more like a conduit to pass on those blessings. We pass blessings on as they come to us. The Dead Sea receives water, but then what does it do with it? It holds it and it stagnates it. And it's, I've never been there. Who has been there? I've had some Dead Sea water that somebody brought back and I got a little vial of it or a little jar of it in my, in my garage. Kind of funny, Dead Sea water in Kansas. Um, but it's just, it's really kind of gross. Those of you that have been there, who has, who has stepped out on it or laid back? I understand you can lie on top of it and you don't even sink down. It just, you've done that? It just receives and it receives and it stagnates and it doesn't pass on. Can fish live in the Dead Sea? If you drink Dead Sea water, are you going to be healthy for very long? Dead Sea produces dead people. Don't drink it. Okay? So God says, Abram, when I bless you, you don't become the Dead Sea. You become a river or a stream that just flows those blessings right into the lives of others. I will bless those who bless you and curse uh, whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Israel becomes the second community. And one of the things God wanted, and we don't have time to look at all these verses, but if you're taking notes, you can write down Isaiah 2, 1 through 5. And you can write down Ezekiel 39, 27 through 38, where God calls Israel to be a light to the nations. And he wants Israel to be the city on the hill that will call all people unto her. And Israel will be the river of blessing that flows into the nations, into the world, into Italy, and into Ethiopia, and into all those nations over there and around the world, and God would bless them through Israel, and they would come to know God. That was God's purpose for Israel. And when Israel failed to understand her purpose, and she believed that she was blessed of God because she was somehow better than others, what happened to Israel? God sent the Assyrians, didn't he? Yes. God sent the Assyrians and said, we're going, to have to, we're going to have to do something different next time. But that doesn't negate the fact that family and then Israel were very important communities that God had developed. And our understanding of Israel now feeds our idea of what the church is about. The church started with the calling of 12 apostles. And the purpose of their call is in Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. In Mark 3, 13 through 15, <clears throat> Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are those he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to whom he gave the name but, um, I just lost the pronunciation. But John, which means son of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. He called these 12 to him that they might be what? With him. And something happens in community when you are with people. When you are with people, what do you become? Like the people you are with, right? That's why those of us who have kids, have you ever told your kids, we prefer that you not be with 
him or her or certain people because their characteristics can rub off on yours? We understand that. Craig Bartholomew and Michael Coheen in the drama of Scripture wrote, to be with Jesus means to center their lives in Him, to watch Him and come to know His way of life, and to listen to Him and be instructed about life in the kingdom. To be with Jesus means to learn of Jesus' intimate communion with the Father and to model their own lives of His life that is empowered by the Spirit. Now, years later, when Jesus called the disciples to be with him, years later, Jesus has died, gone to heaven, and the Sanhedrin calls the apostles in because they're tired of them preaching about Jesus. What is it that the council says about the apostles? They could tell that they had been with Jesus. All the way back in Mark 3 and later in the book of Acts, we see this connection between calling them to be with Jesus and later the enemies of Jesus could tell that these men had been with Jesus. Something happens in the life of community when we're living it and practicing it the way we are supposed to. So this image at the beginning of a leader that's walking along and somebody says, well, what are you? And he says, I'm a leader. And they look back and there's nobody behind them. That's why I say, what, would you, what else would you call that guy? You'd call him crazy because you do not lead unless you have people that are following. And you better be sure if you're following in a spiritual community or you're leading in a community that you are leading in a healthy spiritual way or you are following someone who is leading in a healthy and spiritual way. And one of the principles that comes out of Proverbs about how we lead and the kind of leadership we provide is that we be healthy leaders. Very quickly, Community helps develop proper character. On the other hand, unhealthy community develops unhealthy character. But community provides a place for people to belong and provides character training for people within community. Here's some biblical examples. Okay, Proverbs number one. We'll look at Proverbs first. Biblical examples of community and character building. Number one, Proverbs chapter one, verses eight through 19. We can't spend a lot of time on this because of time, but in this passage, in the first chapter of Proverbs, there's a young man that's about to go out into the world on his own. His mother and father sit him down before he leaves, and verse 8 says, Son, listen to your father. Listen to your mother. How many of us, again, before we went out on our own, had our parents sit us down and say, Look, here's what we've taught you, now remember this. And how many of us have told our kids, you're leaving home now. Here's what we taught you. Remember this. And it goes from everything from making sure you put on clean socks every morning because you don't want to be in a car wreck and have them take you out to the hospital with dirty, stinky socks, right? So change your socks every morning and ideally wash the feet before you put them in there to the kind of people you hang around, the job you get, how you spend your money, your moral behavior, all of that. This last time we're together, we're reminded Here's what we've always taught you. Proverbs 1, chapter 8, beginning, is that kind of a situation where the father and the mother tell the son, you're going to go out and you're going to encounter, you're going to encounter these young men who will say, throw in with us. And they invite you to three things. To have fun, but it's at, at the expense of others. Because they're going to hide at the side of the road and waylay some unsuspecting traveler, meaning they're going to conk him in the head and take his stuff. We're going to have fun together. But we're also going to be friends. We will be friends and family. We will be your group. And what kind of a group is that? That's a gang. Gang activity and crime has been with us a long, long time. It goes all the way back to the time of Proverbs. When a mother and father tell their son, do not get involved with violent criminal gangs. And number three, that's how they're going to get their finances. We will take their plunder and divide it. Fun, friends, Finances. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 through 19. The same kind of lecture we give our children today. 3,000 years ago, mothers and fathers were sitting down with their children and saying, look, when you, when you leave our house and you go out into the world, make sure of these things. Watch out for the people you hang with. Because if that is the community you hang with, they will shape your character, which will be a criminal character, and you will get in trouble. Now, on the other side of the coin, 
Here's the kind of character God wants to see developed. This is in Proverbs 15. The community shapes character for good or for bad. Proverbs chapter 15, verses 31 through 33. He who listens to life-giving rebuke will be at home among the wise. He who ignores discipline despises himself, but whoever heeds correction gains understanding. The fear of the Lord teaches a man wisdom, and humility comes before honor. There's three verses here, and there's a, a writer on Old Testament um, Bible and, and uh, teaching named Kevin Youngblood, who identified in Proverbs, and he sees it kind of condensed right here into these three verses, three levels of character training in the godly community. The first is parents and family. Whoever listens to life-giving rebuke will be at home among the wise. Now, maybe that's just a metaphor for being um, wherever wise people are, if you fit in there, you're at home. But maybe what he's also saying is wisdom starts at home with the family. And what do mom and dad do with the children that they love? They give them rebuke and rebuke is correction. And they teach them and they spank them. The ideal model is you teach when they follow, you acknowledge when they don't, you acknowledge that as well. And you explain why we don't do that. You at some point deliver a spanking, which again, society sometimes frowns on, but in the Bible, it is a important means of helping shape a, a character and a nature. You provide discipline, you give further teaching, and you give them a chance to live that out. Many times as parents, we will panic when our kids make some horribly bad decisions in our home. And yet the truth is that may be the best place for them to make those horribly bad decisions. It makes it very, very tough on us, but it does give us chance when they're still at home to correct and to continue to shape that character before they leave home. Um, the next stage is the larger spiritual community. Verse 32, he who ignores discipline despises himself, but whoever heeds correction gains understanding. We leave our home at some point, and even before we leave home, we're still a part of the larger spiritual community, such as the church. And in a church where there's enough honesty and openness and closeness, we want the other adults in that spiritual community to further the, the aims we have for our children, right? If our children are misbehaving in church, don't we want a loving brother or sister to say, young man, you know your parents wouldn't approve of that. Sit up straight and listen. Do you resent somebody at church when they do that? Or if they see some kind of behavior outside of church that they know is destructive to that child, and they come to you and say, Boy, I don't know how to do this, but I've, I've, I've got to tell you what we saw. And how you deal with it is up to you, but we saw your son, we saw your daughter do this. I had to do that a while back for a young lady that wasn't even from our church, but her parents go to church, they're very spiritual people, and I saw their daughter in a situation, and I told the parents, and I thought, oh, they're going to hate me for this. I mean, in minutes, they called back and said, can we both come over? We want to talk to you. What did you see? Here's what we're dealing with. Do you have any suggestions? They thanked me for it. Okay, that larger community that we call the church is the second level of community development today where God is using the larger community to shape the character of our children and of us. And then the third level, the fear of the Lord. God is that final level of wisdom shaping and character training in the spiritual community. If we ignore our parents... Hopefully someone in the church will get through to us and say, young man or young lady, turn your life around. Live for Jesus. Don't be so rebellious. Don't be so hostile. Listen, that spiritual community called the church steps in to help. But if we ignore that community, then the next level of community character development we encounter is God himself. And there's any number of ways God may get our attention. He may let us slide off the ice and not stop us. And this time he lets us hit the tree. And as we spend three months in a hospital bed, wondering what happened, and finally the police report comes back and says, yes, there was too much alcohol in your system. Now we can't escape it. 
God may use that means to shape our character and say, whoa, I better put the brakes on. I better go back to the training of mom and dad and listen to that. There's any number of ways that God can get our attention. But hopefully what happens is before that ever happens, we stop and we think, you know, dad used to talk about that. My mother used to say, and those words reverberating through the years, shaping the way we think and the way we behave shapes our character and makes us fit not just for life in, but also to lead the community. So, community of Proverbs, the Apostle Paul. When Paul baptized people, what did he do with them? Did he say, good luck out there? No, what did he put them in? He put them in a community, right? He put them in the church. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 14 through 21, Paul says he was like a father to his converts. What do fathers do with their children? They hold them, they nurture them, they teach them how to play sports, they teach them how to bait a hook, they teach them how to... I, I remember my dad teaching us how to dress. You know, that you're, you're, everything lines up straight, right? And the tie should line up straight. And if your tie is here, which I'm not wearing one at camp because people always threaten to cut it off if you do wear one at camp. But if you're wearing a tie here, and I am one of those preachers that still wears a tie on Sunday mornings. I know a lot don't. So, but I'll look in front of a mirror, and if my tie is here, but the buttons are way over here, I know it's crooked. And guess who taught me that? Dad. Make sure it's all lined up straight and you look sharp. Well, I've learned since then I can be it all lined up straight and I may still not look sharp, but at least I don't look <laughs> as bad as I would have otherwise. Um, I remember an old man at my church in Mariana coming up to me and said, you know, I was just down there fishing and there were some 12-year-old boys down there. They did not know how to bait a hook. And I said, boys, where are your dads? How come he never showed you how to do this? And they said, we don't have a dad. And he says, here, let me show you how to do that. He says, I showed those 12-year-old boys, and he was so proud. He was in his 70s, he was retired. He'd go fishing whenever he wanted. He says, I got to show those boys how to bait a hook. Where are their dads? You know, that's, that's kind of sad, isn't it? You, you see what the community does is it teaches us and shapes us everything about life. So when Paul baptizes these converts and they're babes in Christ, he knows they need dads to show them how to bait a hook. But not just the actual physical hook, spiritually, we need older men and women in the church to teach us how to live and to function. He's like a father to his converts. He urged, encouraged, and pleaded with them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12. 1 Thessalonians 2, 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he lost sleep over their welfare. Have you ever lost sleep over how somebody in the church was doing? How the church was doing? Paul did. That was a community that he cared for. He didn't want to burden the churches, so he treated them like a mother and a father. 1 Thessalonians 2. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7. He was like a mother caring for her children. And 1 Thessalonians 2, 8. Bill, what you were talking about to me earlier, he shared not just the gospel with them, but his life. So yes, you teach them that Jesus died on the cross for you, but now that they're baptized and they're in community, now you share your life with them. This is how we live. Um, in the rabbinic system in, in Israel, in Judaism, um, a rabbi will pick a young man to follow him and to mimic his life. And an important part of their training is following this rabbi around and they see how he treats waitresses, they see how he treats the homeless, they see how he does everything. Um, they'll go into the house and watch how he eats a meal with his family and engages with his wife. Um, they'll actually get very personal and try to sneak into your private chambers to watch when you go to bed and how you sleep. They want to so mimic the life of the rabbi that they want to see every moment of his life. Well, I think you can carry that a little bit too far. But the principle is still there. Jesus is the model. We have followed him. Over time, we become a little bit more like him. Now we become the model for someone who's just starting out. You don't just share the gospel. You share your life. If you share the gospel but you don't connect them into community and meaningful, meaningful existence, in essence, what you do is you have a baby and you set it out and you say, good luck. 
And that's not what the gospel teaches we do. So, maintaining community as we become a part of God's community. Whether we are members at first as baptized into the community, born into it, or eventually we're leaders in the community, one thing we want to work hard to do is to maintain it. It's one thing to form community, but quite another to maintain it as a healthy, character-forming entity. A lot of churches today experience a high dropout rate. And there's any number of reasons why we do that. A lot of speculation, but I think one of the big reasons is we may be losing youth and adults in part because we have not built a sense of community with them. They don't feel connected, so it's easy for them to leave us when there is disagreement or there is argument. We need to be together. We need to be close. Building community means we reach out to people, invite them in. And maintaining community means we keep connected to them with personal contact. Conflict is inevitable, but the dissolving of the community is not. We are going to have conflict. We have conflict in our physical families, right? Every spouse, every parent and child. But for the most part, we still hang in there, right? Because they're community. I want to close with this quote from Larry Crabb in his book, Connecting. And incidentally, Larry Crabb, who was a counselor for many, many years and probably still is, um, but for 25 years, he had a very active practice in counseling and psychology. He wrote a lot of the books that were used in colleges at Freed Hardeman back in the 70s in counseling. 25 years after an active practice, he took time off and he reevaluated his life's work. And he said, I've come to the conclusion, because he also did a lot of Bible study and preaching, he said, I've come to the conclusion that if churches practiced life the way the Bible teaches, community life, of, of building up family and building up people and providing proper modeling, listening, which we'll talk about later, um, if they would practice that the way the Bible teaches, most of us counselors could close our doors. Because a lot of what I do can take place in a small group at the church building or a break-off group that, in, that meets in the home, a group of Christians from the local church. A lot of what I do, non-professionals can do in the Spirit of Christ if they have the Spirit of Christ. So Larry Crabb writes in a book called Connecting, the deepest urge in every human heart is to be in relationship with someone who absolutely delights in us. Someone with resources we lack, who has no greater joy than giving to us. Someone who respects us enough to require us to use everything we receive for the good of others. And because he has given it to us, knows we have something to give. The longing to connect defines our dignity as human beings and our destiny as image bearers. The deepest urge in every human heart is to be in relationship with someone who absolutely delights in us. What is it that makes for a healthy childhood? When the children in the family know mom and dad delight in us. Okay, they spank us when we need it. You know, they deprive us of a privilege when we don't deserve it. Hey, mom and dad will do that. But when we're out there trying to swing a baseball bat, they're not just on us all the time about how we're swinging wrong with every swing. And if dad, if you're the coach, mom, you're the coach, you do have to correct the swing, right? But we're never so into that that we fail to just enjoy the moment of being with our child and watching them try to play the game. And even if they didn't get the best hit, and even if they got out sliding into second, what do we still do? We still delight in them. And when they know we delight in them, failures and successes, they grew up with a healthy sense of who they are. And there are adults who never had that. So they're looking for someone who can delight in them. And guess what? When they find that at church, they find that other people who can delight in them even though they still have nasty habits. And even though they still have a moral system that we don't agree with and we think is wrong. And if they don't change, yes, they could be lost because of. But as human beings made in the image of God, we still delight in them even in their failures. Because we see in them an image of the Savior that we value above just how well they behave and perform. And we love them enough to give them time to see the life we model that they want to have for themselves.
So they, they want to be delighted in, and, and it's by someone with resources they lack. So they see in us the lifestyle they want to have, but they don't have. And they also see that we don't just condemn them because of the differences. And they receive those resources, and they also receive the expectation that as you receive and you grow, you now share with someone else. We actually place expectations on them that they continue the cycle of healthy community life and leadership. And that's a principle that grows out of Proverbs. It's a principle that grows out of Paul's life and community called the church. And it certainly grows out of the life of Jesus Christ. And that's what God wants to see duplicated in the life of the church today. Thank you.